Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, session. Welcome to this uh, online session from the from the Institute of Modern Languages Research. This is the the second seminar in a series of seminars um, called uh, World Literature and Translation. And um, the series is uh, sponsored by the Convocation Trust at the University of London. And uh, the trust exists to uh, fund events uh, that happen across the Federation, the University of London Federation, and involve uh, colleagues and networks from across the Federation. And so um, we're co-convening this seminar with LINCS, which is the London Intercollegiate Network for Comparative Studies. Um, and um, we're using uh, the seminar series to discuss uh, questions of, around world literature, what has become known as world literature in a context uh, of the study of languages. And um, today we're very uh, privileged to hear from Professor Francesca Orzini, who has been working for many years on bringing uh, non-European perspectives and uh, working on non-European languages um, to this question and bringing this, this perspective to this question of, of world literature. Um, and uh, this uh, is the kind of work that we we want to do as part of the of the seminar of the seminar series. Um, I'll just mention very briefly that our next event is on eco translation, and that is taking place on the second of December at one pm UK time. And I will post the link to the registration in the chat. Um, but without further ado, I will introduce uh, our speaker today. And um, I'll then uh, pass over to Francesca, who's going to speak for around 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions uh, at the end. So uh, Francesca Orzini is Professor of Hindi and South Asian Literature at SOAS University of London and a Fellow of the British Academy. She's currently completing an ERC uh, research project on multilingual locals and significant geographies for a new approach to world literature from the perspective of three literary regions, North India, the Maghreb and the Horn of Africa. As part of this project, she is co-editing a book entitled The Form of Ideology and the Ideology of Form, Third World Print Cultures and Internationalisms Between Decolonization and the Cold War with uh, Nilam uh, Sriva Starva and Letitia uh, Zucchini. And uh, appropriately, uh, Francesca's uh, title today uh, is uh, Beyond the Two Shores, Indian Magazines and World Literature Between, Decoloniz uh, between Decolonization and the Cold War. Um, I'm just going to very quickly say that this session is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear in the recording, then please do uh, switch your video off. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, you can post it in the chat. And we can put that question to Francesca at the end. Or uh, and what I'll do is I'll prompt you to come on screen to ask your question. Um, but if you'd like to ask an anonymous question, then you can always direct it to me and then I can put that to Francesca. So Francesca, I'll pass right over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. And thank you, everybody, for uh, joining, uh, joining us. And uh, also apologies for those who've uh, may have seen or heard a, a sort of previous incarnation of this uh, talk, which is very much part of the work that I'm doing on uh, on magazines, um, particularly Hindi magazines of the 50s, 60s and, and 70s. But there's a something new, so she tell, bear with me. Um, so let me just jump in and I think it'll be clear what, what I mean. And um, so, this is 1969, and um, it's a special issue of on the international story of the Hindi uh, short story magazine Sarika, Starling, edited by the writer Kamleshwar for the Times of India group in Bombay, so a commercial magazine. Now, the first story was Joao Guimaraes Rosa, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong, celebrated story, The Third Bank of the River. Nadika Tisrakinara, and it's translated by Dharmvir Bharti, one of in Hindi's foremost modernist poets and playwrights, who in fact was soon to start editing uh, another of the Times of India uh, sort of Hindi magazines. 
Now, if you look, this uh, special issue contains um, 24 stories from four continents, from Brazil to North Vietnam, from Kenya, Ngugi, uh, Vationgo, to Indonesia, from Iran to Yugoslavia, to from Germany and France, to Sierra Leone, Japan, and Mauritius. Um, and already before, and I'll come back to it in a moment, already before becoming editor of this magazine, Kamleshwar, uh, who is one of the most famous Hindi, you know, new short story writers, sort of, sort of post social realism, you could say, um, had brought up similar special issues, examples, uh, yeah, of what I call spectacular internationalism, which made visible to Hindi readers much of the literary world. This, uh, and I'll come back to this in, a, in uh, slightly later on, but you know, you see before he was earlier uh, editor of um, another short story magazine called New Short Stories, Naikahania. Then he became editor of Sarika uh, until the, uh, 1978. Mm. Um, and if, if I think that when I started to work on Hindi and, and ever since, in fact, the, the talk has all been about Hindi's provincialism, um, this kind of special issues have been a, a big surprise and in fact quite overwhelming and I'm still sort of trying to wrap my hand around it because I really don't know of any mainstream magazine anywhere in the world offering such a wide range. And I'm still amazed that Borges, Ngugi, Pramodian Antator, no one I'd never heard of before, Benedict Anderson, uh, Garcia Marquez, Mario Benedetti and so on were all available inexpensively to Hindi readers in the 1960s and 70s. So part of my talk today, or most really my talk today is about the magazine as a crucial vehicle and platform for making world literature visible. And I strongly believe that we should add visibility more to our world literature keywords, because without some visibility, without knowing that, that there's some, some literature there, um, there will be no translation, there will be no circulation, familiarity or canonization. So to me, like, yes, translation, but before translation, you need visibility. Now, magazines have been usually discussed in the Anglo-American terms of little magazine, like in Eric Bolson's work, book, Little Magazine World Form. So as sort of championing champions of modernism, typically poetry, and re rebelling against the literary establishment. And although in fact, in Little Magazine World Forum, Bolson talks about, you know, very much acknowledges that, you know, Little Magazine does not cover the variety of forms in, you know, Japanese or Italian or, or French uh, um, or Bengali that he, um, he mentions. Again and again, uh, the emphasis is on uh, the Little Magazine, Modernism, and, and Poetry. But in Hindi, in fact, um, yes, and, and this is part, actually, uh, as I was saying, a talk, part of a kind of a current interest in uh, the magazine and world literature. We have a webinar series uh, every, uh, every month. Uh, we've had the first four. And if you're interested, just email me afterwards, and I can add you to the, to the list. Now, in the Hindi context, magazines were not, you know, liter lit little alternative or rebelling. Uh, I mean, there were little magazines, uh, Letizia Zecchini, Angelina Laker have worked on them. But in fact, Hin magazines were simply the mainstay of literary publication. And in most cases, they can hardly be called small. In fact, in the early 20th century, magazines were kind of 100 page plus miscellanies. And in the period that I discussed today, so the 50s through really the early 70s, uh, you can see that there's a kind of wide ec ec ecology, wide typology of magazines from sort of broadsheets like Illustrated Weekly of India, Dharam Yug, Caravan, to smaller format magazines, um, a few of which like Kahani, Naikahania, Sarika, only devoted to the short story. And in fact, you can see here, the Times of India itself had a, a whole kind of family, as it says, of, uh, of magazines, uh, newspapers, but also magazines. 
So some were politi literary political reviews, some were broadsheets, some were middle brow, uh, like uh, Sarita. Um, and the circulation reached between 15,000 to 60,000. So many times higher than the print run of any new literary book. Um, and it, I think it's important to think about, you know, when we uh, today, the material that I'm presenting is that um, these stories, so we're not, so these magazines were not little magazines aimed at sort of uh, the avant-garde, but really at a broad reading public, uh, which, and, and that goes with the emphasis on the story. So some of the questions that I have today are, how do magazines do world literature? Is it different from the, the world literature? Is the experience of both producing but also reading world literature in the magazines different from the book series or the anthology or the course or the canonization through prizes? Um, and I'm, and I'm interested in the way they produce what I call thick or thin knowledge uh, and familiarity. And what do the differences in the kind of ways in which they present world literature um, signify and what effect they have? Now, the Cold War, as others have pointed out before me, is a rich period in this respect because um, Soviet Russia, the US and China had a political interest in investing in writers and texts from Asia, Africa and Latin America. Um, so investing in, in publishing and translating them. The urge to win the hearts and minds of intellectuals and people, or at least not to lose them through to the other side, translated in vast programs that several people have worked on of book and publishing, pub, magazine publishing, translations, and other forms of literary soft power. So my one of my other my main questions today is what is the relationship between political affiliation and literary selection and visibility? Do literary choices map? onto political ones. Another question that I find interesting is that of temporality. Uh, and you'll see why from the material. So Andrew Ho uh, Rubin and Elizabeth Holt have argued that the magazines in the Cold War produced a global simultaneity of literary time for the first time. For the first time. And I find this true more as an aspiration than a fact to a large extent. So it's repeated as an aspiration, but when you look at what is published, it's not quite true. In fact, the relationship between political and literary timing is an interesting one in this period. Uh, and, I, and I sort of try, I'm struggling to uh, articulate it, but it seems to me like political time or affiliation pulls material from earlier periods into the present. And so while I argue with Bolson's argument that the magazines show the world as a as descent, literary world as descended, I actually find it more useful to think in terms of location and affiliation. And in fact, um, to connect to the theme of the series, translation and world literature, I'm almost 100% sure that all the stories translations in Hindi magazines were from English. And the work of assembling them in these spectacular special issues was one of sampling from a range of English language sources, uh, books and magazines. Uh, so, and that of course takes us back to the Cold War context where such abundance of translations were available. Um, and I also, and finally, for my, for my general points, I I'm definitely want to move away from the historical narrative, uh, linear narrative that unfortunately present also in Eric Bolson's book. Uh, so that the magazines in post-colonial countries somehow always come after, you know, sort of ideally and aesthetically um, following the model of the Anglo-American little magazines, which is not the case here. So yeah, this is broadly uh, where, how I understand the magazine as sort of speaking to world literature, to literary activism of the editors, the short story and the Cold War. So to come back to, um, to Rosa's story. So if I, I think the, the little uh, um, uh, presentation that uh, the magazine gives is quite you know, apt. Um, so in the story, as, as some, many of you will know, so you're, it's a story told by the son of a father his father suddenly leaves his family, his job, abandons all responsibility to go and live in the middle of the river on a boat. And he never comes ashore. Uh, and the son is puzzled. And, you know, this remains a big question. What is, 
what is happening, is the father mad, no, he's not mad, so what is he after? And at the end, in fact, he sort of follows the father, when the father dies, he follows him in the, on the boat. Um, and both the editor and the readers sort of um, read it as a, um, you know, a spiritual, and in fact, this is most, you know, the critical uh, readings are that this is about the two shores, and then the third is, is you know, looking for a transcendent spiritual dimension. Um, and it was the most appreciated story of the collection. Now, interestingly, um, Kamleshwa drew upon the title, uh, the, the, the shores, the, the three, the looking for the third shore, the third bank of the river, in the title that, that, uh, of his editorial that's called Fed Up or Tired of Both Shores. And I read the both shores here as the two shores of the Cold War. And it is part of uh, the um, interesting kind of um, articulation, which is really what you know, I'm interested in today, of what third world means and does for, for him. Uh, so as you can see, he says uh, that, um, you know, in fact, he's kind of articulating an early, you know, global south, hmm, that the, the voice of this of these stories, but remember that it includes also Beul, Robrier, and so on. But clearly, he's also marking a difference between underdeveloped, undeveloped and or developing countries and developed countries. Um, so in in developing countries or third world struggling for economic freedom, men, and we are still in the sort of third person. Uh, you know, masculine singular, has become prey to disintegration, despondency, lack of value, values, his smoldering in the fire of history that has been bestowed upon him. He doesn't like this world. Meanwhile, whatever the vo political voice of the great power, this is why I think of the two, you know, two blocks, m there, even there, in, I think in the developed world, the man is dejective and alone. In a later issue, we'll come back a little later in 1973, Kamleshwa comes back more um, directly on the third world. And my personal hunch, but I'd be curious to know what you think, is that the kind of the more, you know, this is a mainstream magazine. So the more political tone is kind of offset by the funny cover of uh, the statue with, uh, with, with glasses. Um, now, and, and what I'm interesting here, here is that, um, as you can see, it's a very clear decolonizing, you know, third worldist uh, sort of um, political voice per se. Hmm? Uh, but uh, the, the stories, in fact, and this is in line with Kamleshwa's own kind of aesthetic, are really not political stories, but stories about individuals struggling at a more existential level. Hmm? And that we go back to the kind of, you know, so you've got the political third world, this, but aesthetically. And we come back to uh, Rosa's story when he says that, you know, the material, the political are superficial matters, that this third dimension, um, very concrete, but very deep. And then actually it's a common fundamental voice of all stories, uh, living midstream, tired of both shores. So, you know, of course, Kamleshwar is using this idea of the third, of the of midstream, of tired of the two shores at, at different levels. Mm. Right, so, um, yes. So this is a kind of, um, so, so I'm, um, what I'm, I'm struggling with uh, here, as you can see, is the idea of the way Kamleshwa employed the anti-colonial language and this of third worldism, but to emphasize an inner existentialist dimension of the post-colonial condition. So note that Rosa here is there with Rob Grier, La Plage, and Di Blasse Anna, Pale Anna by Boehl. So, uh, you know, range of, uh, of also aesthetics. Um, and, and if we compare it with, uh, you know, with a magazine from upon which I think he actually drew for um, several of the African, particularly the African or Middle Eastern um, authors. So Efwa Sutherland, Abiyose Nicole, Abdel 
Ahmed al Bevali all recur in uh, in uh, in Sarika, mm, and I think he also draws upon the book reviews uh, in some of his articles. Where he does depart is in the kind of more clear alignment of Lotus with um, uh, with the Eastern Bloc, or with or, or at least with the uh, with the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, from which in fact it also got funds. Um, yes, so. Mm, so my talk really also is trying to be about the different inflections of aesthetics and ideology in the context of the Cold War within the Third World. But in order to do that, let me first go to a sort of more general point about um, the magazine and world literature and the different ways in which different magazines do world literature. I also want to put the kind of 1950s later in juxtaposition or the more kind of clear affiliation of the 1950s in the two bloc with the uh, with this sort of third worldist uh, opening I think in the 60s and 70s so um, so doing a kind of survey of in, of in Indian Hindi and English magazines of the of, of this period I find quite interestingly that stories that all of them want to do world literature but they do it in quite different ways so Kahani which I'll talk about in a, in a little while, <clears throat> which is a very translational story. In fact, half of its every issue is on contemporary stories from contemporary uh, Indian literatures. And it will have one story, uh, more one foreign story, uh, as we'll see typically from the Eastern Bloc or China. And I call this textual presence. So, you know, the, the literature is there through a translation. A, a middle-brow English magazine like Caravan uh, goes for what I call random systematicity. So it will have short stories about from around the world, but then what what occupies that slot is a bit random. Uh, so <clears throat> you will have Arabia represented by a German writer, or you know, it's a bit like just fill that slot. Hmm? And and um, then Yukchetna and Quest, which are I mean Yukchetna is actually. Um, uh, so the consciousness of the age is a magazine that says it's devoted to world literature uh, and quest, which is the uh, Indian Council for Country of Freedom uh, magazine. They mostly do for what I call indirect presence. So they mostly uh, do world literature through critical articles, occasionally poems and very few stories. Kalpana, and I'll do it in a, I'll see it in a moment, does it also in a different way. Uh, and that's also the, the, the uh, House Sur, uh, the Argentinian um, ma uh, magazine, uh, does India when it has a special issue on India, which is survey, you know, so lots of names, a kind of critical introduction, um, and, and, and we'll go, get to it in a moment. And then this is what I call the spectacular internationalism. And I'd be very curious to know what you think about, you know, the different, the different experience and the different you know, that this typology sort of suggests. To get quickly to Kahani, uh, so you can see that uh, these are just two uh, random numbers. Uh, this is broadly a progressive store, progressive magazine. Um, so as you can see, very committed to um, Indian literature. And uh, in fact, this, and this I think is the first time that an African story is translated in a Hindi magazine too. Um, it's very interested in um, it's, it's sort of very interested in the story and in the magazine as a kind of democratic space where you know readers will participate. There is a Kahani club, uh, sort of a short story club where you know people should get together, but there's also a page where you can write in what your memorable story was, what story you liked most. They have these sort of questions like, is entertainment the aim of a story? Yes, but no, but. Mm. Um, it does what I call a soft progressivism. Huh? So though politically in terms of internationalism is quite oriented, actually in terms of the stories they're published, you know, it's not all workers and peasants. And democratic also in terms of making a lot of content available very cheaply. Hmm? Um, I've been interested in the editor's brother, um, who's also a writer, 
um, both are sons of Prince, and there's his suggestion for Kahani of what to publish. And you can see it's not, you know, it's about new talent. Huh? So as I said, quite, quite uh, um, paradoxically, the Indian writing appears more modern and more experimental than the foreign writing. So published stories of the Ustad, of the masters of the story, uh, publish humorous stories. Um, and interestingly, although while uh, for Hindi and Indian writers, you know, photographs, um, little introductions, even their um, addresses, you know, where you can contact them, you know, create a sense of a fa family of writers, a familiarity. That's not true for the foreign stories. No way. Apart from Kenyatta, in fact, there's no introduction whatsoever. Now, if you look at the, uh, what, are, what is published in terms of foreign stories, you can see that the majority are from the Eastern Bloc. So China, actually most in the 50s, Russia, though earlier, tends to be somewhat earlier hmm, for Cheko, uh, and the e Eastern Europe quite substantially, but also kind of, you know, so that's what I call, you know, the politically, it's the affiliation of the now, but the stories that are, translated at largely earlier ones. So I don't know if that, and the transliteration doesn't help sometimes to know who is, who is there, okay. who's, what's the uh, writer. So in this, there's one, for example, in which, you know, you know progressive Chinese story in which uh, a young couple decide that they will have a new kind of celebration and they will not have, you know, the lavish um, rituals and gift giving and so on, no dowry and, you know, so that's a very, pro and you have some, uh, you know, extraordinary worker story, but largely they're more like this uh, Moorish story, which could have been actually a, a prince and an early Hindi story, you know, of, about a mother who's so, who's poor, she needs to find one coin in order to buy some thread to men, oh no, soap, soap to, to, to wash her husband's working clothes. And, 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 and it's all about the poverty and the dismal room in which they live, but it's all made into a kind of funny story. So she can transform poverty into sort of a, a livable and live through and with resilience and fun and humor. You will notice, how, that, however, that there is in fact, as Amrit, um, Right, uh, wanted sort of stories from Western Europe uh, and a few from um, sort of often progressive USA, American writers. Uh, this goes with the kind of um, uh, publications, uh, I mean, the affiliation of the st of uh, uh, Kahani, the kind of books that it published or it sort of distributed. Mm -hmm. You can see here sort of Chinese and Soviet books. Uh, and kind of advertisements, China reconstructs, the TAS publications in India, uh, New China special issue and so on, and its own translation of Mother. But also of uh, Fontamara, interestingly. And, and this also ma ma maps on to kind of local Cold War tensions in the 1950, where Amritrai writes a whole article denouncing uh, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. So the US kind of aligned or liberal um, uh, sort of association as uh, sort of um, pallbearers of American imperialism. To give you another sense of instead a different way in which another magazine does world literature, this more arty kalpana or imagination, these are uh, covers by the, one of the major Indian modernist um, uh, painters, M.F. Hussain, publishes mostly um, Hindi writers, but in terms, how does it do world literature? Interestingly, it translates from um, um, books abroad, uh, what is now uh, world, world, world literature, isn't it? Um, these very long articles that were published on surveys of, uh, you know, by professors, um, and, and this is the original from uh, Books Abroad. So Spanish, Latin American, Brazilian, Austrian, Israeli, Catalonian. And I mean, I, I'm giving you it in English, but just to give you a sense of, you know, how dense, how many names, uh, in fact, much more than 
to 25 years. Um, and, and my question is, you know, what would have been the experience for a Hindi reader who, you know, would have seen all these names and, you know, names of trends and so on without seeing any of the texts? Now, to get to the 1960s uh, and to Sarika, so before, um, before Kamleshwa joined the magazine, uh, and actually also after, you know, you can see that um, Sarika does world literature itself in different ways. If you look at the kind of the range of stories published, you know, you have mostly uh, European. Um, then it also has a sort of column on what is the story from the view of the master, so much more canonical, but also offset by a series of articles uh, by Kamleshwar on the Egyptian story, the Iranian story, the Indonesian story. So short surveys that, however, sort of create, aim to create familiarity. Uh, they, they sort of, they present writers and trends very much using the terms that would have been familiar to Hindi, uh, Hindi readers. Huh? So uh, using you know, some of the key terms of the new short stories that Kamleshwar himself was part of. So tracing a similar kind of trajectory from realist to instead more like stories about the new conditions or um, the new experiences, hmm? which we also saw in the editorial. Again, Still a bit of a putpuri, uh, so uh, Tibetan, Mopassan, kind of Indianized in this funny way, a translation of Don Quixote, and then Virbharti, London Travelogue. Hmm? So, and this is to say, so there is translations, but there are also other ways, you know, snippets or um, notices, book reviews uh, that bring the world, uh, and make the, make, make the magazine a, a platform. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see there's also quite a bit of influence of sort of film, I suppose. Huh? Um, and in fact, you know, um, one of the columns uh, of world literature is about autobiographies and you get even Sophia Loren. Um, as I say, towards the mid 60s and in, then in the later and 70s, this broadens into much more kind of third world. Mm -hmm. um, now, it so already from the 69, it includes that these issues include stories from kind of hot political hotspots like Indonesia, North Vietnam, and several from Arabic, uh, sort of Middle East, Africa, and Latin, Latin America. But the stories themselves veered between sort of Songugi, uh, here you have, you know, uh, the martyr, the famous story, the martyr, sort of on the limits of liberal paternalism, um, or Mahmoud Taimur. Um, uh, the Egypt, uh, Arabic writer, Egyptian Arabic writer Mahmoud Taimur, sensational first person narrative of an ordinary man who's disgusted by his anonymity and courts fame by claiming to be the murderer of a famous actor. Or Mario Benedetti's office satire, which have been sounded so familiar to Hindi readers. Or uh, Rob Grier's sort of exercise in description, perception, and surface meaning. So there isn't really one definition of, world, of third world literature that, um, that applies here. Um, uh, now, the third world issue, as we've seen, seen already, kind of includes some of the um, most celebrated names of Latin American and post-colonial literature. So Juan Rulfo, Miguel Andes Asturias, Jose Donoso, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, the, uh, Chino Achebe, and so on. And yet, not, again, not all the stories are about, despite the, you know, the, the um, editorial, uh, which was all about you know, the post-colonial you know, colonial exploitation and the post-colonial condition, not all the stories are about um, exploitation or colonization or even post-colonial um, alienation. Um, so these are just the Latin American ones. So Mario Benedetti's Misiriarte imagines a secretary falling in love with the voice and imagined identity of a woman rather than the person herself. Donoso's Anna Maria is about the tender friendship between a poor gardener and a little world girl. And several of them are actually quite earlier or Borges Emma Zunz. Hmm? So, and again, I think it's the kind of, you've got 
either you call it attention or or you could say a kind of a uh, transposition of um, the um, temporality or the older temporality that brings the story within the political perspective of the present. Uh, bureau trading by um, uh, Bernard B. Traven. Now, where does where do the where did um, um, so uh, the point about translation is that it's completely uh, de-emphasized. Mm? So languages are sometimes mentioned, but sometimes not even. Uh, and um, and in fact, in one of the editorials, Kamleshwar says, "Well, the story is the universal language, and the different languages are just its scripts." So we are really at the polar opposite of untranslatability. It's a real sense of, you know, uh, this is a common language of the story. And in terms of sources, I think, as I, uh, as I said, you know, while I think that, for example, um, for the African stories, um, uh, Kamleshwa drew on uh, Lotus, so, you know, very leftist publication, Another source seems to be Short Story International, which is a more kind of middle-brow American story magazine. And it's really about, you know, as I said, this kind of sampling and, and curating. But whereas, for example, in Short Story International, you would have mostly European stories and then one or two non-European ones, you can see how the, the um, kind of per percentage is um, inverted here. Uh, as I say, compared to Lotus, because you can see that, you know, both the sense of, um, you know, these are world writers, uh, they are known as widely to the world reader as the names of. Uh, so this idea of making them world writers, visible, hmm? um, is it standing on equal footing with world literature of the highest standard. Hmm? This is the editorial of the first issue. This kind of uh, orientation is completely absent. Huh? So the more kind of anti, you know, anti-capitalist, anti-American, imperialism, special issue on Lenin, um, you know, the more political, you could say, side of Lotus is completely absent. And I'm just getting to the conclusions now. Uh, so this would be, you know, I think this is a kind of third world, the third worldism of Lotus is one that perhaps is more uh, familiar or that is more, you know, we more, uh, we would more um, identify third worldism, literary third worldism with. So what I think is quite, in, is particularly interesting with Kamleshwar is that you, you could, as I said, you know, you could hear that political voice but where the literary uh, third worldism is actually quite different. It's not to say that Lotus only has political stories, as I said, not at all, but this is a very significant strand, I would say. Uh, so, you know, I would say, you know, quite a lot of these uh, writers would be uh, from, probably drawn from, uh, from Lotus. And I mean, the fact that you can have an African literary issue in, uh, Hindi in the 70s is still quite surprising to me, or, or not surprising, but amazing to me. Uh, and as you can see, you know, and there are other ones that I'm keen to explore. So you can see how uh, Kamleshwar is also playing with different configurations and they're not, some are more um, political. So of course, Palestinian resistance literature, some are not political at all. The courtesan, love, um, <coughs> really interesting Indian world literature in 71, historical, the whole history of the story. Stories from neighboring countries, again. Huh? So this idea of, you can see trying to direct different gazes, I suppose, huh? and use the magazine for that. So huh, to conclude, and I've got a bit of a long conclusion. So I hope I, I, you know, so this is part, I suppose, of our interest in the, in our webinar series on the crucial role that magazines play in literary world make, making. And often, and particularly in, in the cases of the magazines that are, so not the little magazine, but avant-garde, but of these main, more mainstream magazine or short story international, it is the story, hmm? of course, as Sheetal uh, Pravin Chandra would say, this supremely portable genre that can, 
can be easily called upon to represent a country, which is the currency and unit of exchange. Now, how do magazines, these ephemeral print objects, produce world literature? Hmm? And I've stressed visibility, familiarity, temporality as categories of analysis, affiliation, hmm, and, and I've assessed different kinds of thick and thin coverage. And I would say that probably rather than the regular monthly slot, I would say that the uh, special issue, uh, the spectacular special issue, um, and the textual presence um, that make more literature and the literature of the new world, as Kamleshwar would put it, much more visible. But also, of course, that magazines like Sarika produce multiple visions of world literature, some more canonical, some more eclectic. Now, isn't the considerable investment needed for sourcing and translating texts incommensurate to the time it takes to read and discuss a, a magazine? Huh? Is it worth it? And I think this is the reason why such intensive bouts of literary activism or translational activism usually do not last more than five years, is my kind of sense, unless you have you know, particular strong backing or academic backing. Well, yes and no, I think, because particularly if the magazine is the main platform for literature and for literary reading. Um, then I think we saw that in the context of, world, of the Cold War, that overlaid ideological fault lines within the Indian literary sphere, um, Hindi editors like Kamleshwa, so the, the literary, literary activists, you could say, like Kamleshwa, pulled out from the archive uh, of the Cold War archive stories from third world literatures and translated them into Hindi. As we see, they cheerfully source material from this abundant archive without dwelling on their sources, they never say, nor were the hurdles of translation ever mentioned, or who the translators were, unless they were kind of well-known writers. As I said, the story was a common idiom and different languages, merely a script. We saw that particularly in the 50s, literary significant geographies mapped onto political ones. So editors made some geographies, so Kahani, you know, China and uh, the Eastern Bloc, Eastern Europe, the USSR more visible, and some writers and region recur more often than, rather, than others. And when, and, and, I, and you can also see kind of interestingly in Sarika that when, you know, consciously, they are conscious that, you know, these Latin American, African, Middle Eastern or Southeast Asian writers will not be familiar. So, you know, they will have little blurbs or little or, or, or articles that will introduce them and produce familiarity through paratext whereas there's no need to introduce you know, the masters of the story, a Chekhov or a Gorky or a Saroyan. Uh, right, and I think I could probably finish here with the last one last point. Um, yes, so I suppose to re reinstate, restate the fact that um, in the 70s, late 60s and 70s, in place of the east-west frame of the two blocks, third worldism becomes a way to broaden and realign the literary gaze, introducing contemporary African, Latin American, and Southeastern literatures, albeit not politically engaged. And, and as I said, you know, this literary third worldism, if we can call it that way, was more aesthetically eclectic than its political orientation suggests. And it's always about a curiosity to discover what literatures lie beyond the term, behind the term third world. Um, yeah, and as I say, the fact that this wide ranging and stylistically eclectic world literature activism um, appears in special issues like Naika Hanik and Sarika is very impressive. And I just don't see a parallel in Western magazines, even those oriented toward the world like Sur or the Paris Review. In fact, I would say that from our current perspective in the age of the global Anglophone, it is ironic that the decline of magazine activism in search of stories to translate may well be one of the unintended consequences of the end of the Cold War. Now, the question of visibility, and this is really my last point, 
is usually answered in world literature models or dismissed, you could say, via the argument about the domination of the market or the power differentials in the world literary system. So world literature is that which gets supported by the global system of publishing and prizes, and it is one and unequal. But I think we only need to look at the debate about race or the invisibility of black and minority uh, people on TV in public culture to see that it's not enough to stop there and say, okay, it's unequal. I think one should be spurred to uh, correct and fight this invisibilization hmm, that impoverishes us all and impoverishes the notion of world literature. Hmm? And I particularly like you know, the blog of Anne Morgan, Area of Reading the World, I see this as a kind of literary activism in the way that Amit Shodri talks about it. And I invite you all to join us, join us on the, our Multilingual London event on Saturday, where we are showcasing uh, poets and writers in London who write in languages rather than English. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Francesca. We can't clap you, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure, you know, that was just a fascinating talk and I'm sure people will want to thank you for that. Um, just to remind people that you can use the chat if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand and you uh, should be able to find the raise hand function in the participants. If you click on the participants section at the bottom of your screen, if you can't find it, please just say in the chat that you'd like to ask a question and um, you, can un you should be able to unmute yourself. Perhaps I can uh, begin, Francesca, uh, just kick us off. Um, thank you for such a fascinating uh, talk. And it, 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 it struck me that um, there's something uh, here, when, it, when you were talking about the link between uh, the, polit the political here, mm -hmm. I, I wondered, I had a question about the short form, and you did come onto this a bit later. Is there something specific about the short form and then I thought how does how does the short form in particular map onto your um, thick and thin you're reading thick and thin knowledge in these magazines um, yeah so is, is there a particular link is, is 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 the short form a kind of privileged uh, genre because of the way it, it, it because of it because of the way because of its proximity to the political that's my question uh, well, I think it's more to do with the with the with the magazine. I would say, you know, in the sense that um, um, you know, the magazine, of course, thrives on short forms. And actually, you know, if you think so, if you think, you know, if I think of Lotus, which is a more, you know, political in the sense of you know this sort of explicitly political um, um, and and. Revolution, in fact, you know, political in in this period, third world is political tends to be revolutionary, doesn't it? With the sort of uh, um, the tricontinental and so on, but also in Europe, uh, often, in fact, it's not the story. Hmm? I think it would say I would say probably it's more the art, the uh, you know, other genres. So it could be, you know, that's a work of Neelam Shivasta. It could be the testimonial. Mm, for example, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, or the poem, uh, often a very kind of stirring poem, and you have plenty of, in fact, poem. You know, Lotus is much more about poems than uh, than magazine than uh, stories. So stories more, yeah, stories are are, are, are you know more eclectic or more fluid, uh, and in fact, in a sense, what I notice, I mean, what I was um, sort of highlighting was the um, the contrast, you could say, uh, between the very political language of the editorial and the less political language of the stories. No? I mean, I tried to make the point with, um, you know, Rosa itself, you know, I mean, it's a sort of philosophical story, uh, but um, Kamleshwa sort of bends it to a more political read. Uh? Um, you know, I think, um, I mean, Garcia Marquez story there is not, you know, you, I think you have to read more, about, know more about Garcia Marquez to know that this would be a political writer. You know, the story of, uh, you know, the poor woman going to ask about, you know, her dead husband. Is this about poverty or is it about, you know, 
a radical or revolutionary politics. So um, actually, I think the, and maybe that's also more fitting for a magazine that I that I think even in the covers or in the sketches is kind of kind of mediating between a more political gaze, I see, you know, so for me, it's like, it's this interesting gaze towards, you know, North Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, you know, African decolonizing countries, and then an aesthetics that is not, and that has to do also with the location, you know, an aesthetics that is not that of progressive writing in Hindi, huh? which would be actually quite different, which would be more like, you know, workers and peasants and exploitation and so on. This is not what many of the stories are about. Sorry, let me just turn the light on. But thank you. I've answered. Yes, thank thank you, Francesca. I've got so I've got a question that came that popped up in the chat. I don't know. It's from uh, Nimi. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, Nimi. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Uh, um. I that was just an awesome talk, and it's kind of made my brain explode. I'm um, currently exploring storytelling in NCRT textbooks right. um, in English medium textbooks specifically. So you're obviously talking about the Hindi aspects um, and I just kind of have you explored whether this kind of short storytelling sampling happens elsewhere? Is it just the Hindi phenomenon? And obviously there is this linguistic issue here where Hindi is the mass consumption um, more so than English is, English is, which might be, you know, English might be viewed as a slightly elitist language in this time period. Um, so I just wanted to know a little bit more about, yeah, those kind of, <laughs> that area that right. you discovered. Um, well, I suppose, you know, to make another point more explicit that I suppose was implicit in the talk was, you know, you can see how, sorry, and, and I'll come to your question in a moment. Um, you know, the kind of Bolson narrative of, you know, Anglo-American modernism and then post-colonial as somehow responding to the Anglo-American really doesn't work here. You know, it's, it's another geography here. You know, it's another gaze and another opening. Now, as I said, I mean, all of the, I think all of these stories are taken, translated from English, you know, so they mm -hmm. must have been available in English in the libraries, through personal networks, you know, so I can't imagine that, you know, English, you know, would have less availability because these are clearly sampled hmm, and, and collected. What I think is really interesting is, is that why I think is interesting, the kind of the curatorial, um, you know, literary activism that, you know, you may have hundreds of stories of, you know, and you know, hundreds of French and Italian and American and English stories, but you choose three amongst 25 stories from Asia and Africa. You know, that really kind of re, uh, you know, rebalances uh, the, and, and as I say, realigns the gaze in a, in a way that is not, oh, post-colonial English, so it must be, they must be looking to English or to American or, you know, it's, it's a completely different ball game. The same trend is found in the textbooks. That's the thing I'm finding most yeah, fascinating. I, I would be so surprised if it would be just Hindi. You know, I know that mm. Bengal, I mean, I don't know, but certainly Bengali, I know Urdu. I mean, what one other interesting, really interesting thing that struck me here is the presence of all these Arabic, Arabic stories, because in Hindi, we tend to have this kind of blank spot about West Asia. Mm? Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, it was really interesting. So it's not really about, our common past or Arabic in India, but it's really this sort of 50s Bandung, uh, you know, post Bandung, Nasser, um, you know, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> affiliation and solidarity. After all, the Indian Council for Cultural Relation, the equivalent of, you know, the British Council type of, not quite British Council, but the cultural, outward looking cultural association issues a magazine in Arabic. So mm -hmm. Arabic, West Asia, the Arab world is very much on their radar. Thank you. Muted. Sorry. Thanks for your question. Um, I'm just going to move down the list. I think the next question was um, uh, Nab Nabanipa. Are you are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Hi. Hi. 
so basically like my work i'm i'm more of a like a, from a historical standpoint i'm looking at the cold war in south asia particularly uh, focusing on the bangladesh liberation war and its impact on the cold war so uh, and i am all, all i'm looking at magazines and songs and their impact on how they transcended borders from india to bangladesh so my question was that what was the consumption rate of like particularly these hindi magazines within india and like did they transcend the borders particularly like if they had translations if they transcend indian borders and uh and so how can we as historians change uh, the the cold war discourse through uh, looking at mag such literary uh magazines and their impact right again i mean i don't think that uh, thank you uh i don't think that these stories these magazines necessarily circulate i mean circulated beyond hindi readers but this to me does two things one it makes uh, you know again um and this goes back to the argument about location you know you can be located uh in what seems to be a regional local you know uh, provincia but very worldly you no know? very open and very uh, um and this and and the other is as i as i was saying you know that this is kind of predicated on uh sort of indirect translation mm -hmm. so again it would have to be you know other what are they drawing upon huh? what are they drawing upon uh, and I, and i've and again i'm really you know i haven't i haven't read it yet but i'm really curious to read and it seems to me something that you know really nobody does at this time is to look at neighbors hmm? yeah so you know again if you think of you know center periphery or or you're looking at the distant political affiliations but this sense of you know himal huh? magazine does it but apart from himal nobody does huh? in a cultural literary terms of thinking okay what is produced in you know our, in our neighbors so that's that's quite striking i would be really curious to know but i don't think they cir it circulates but i don't think it's necessarily it necessarily matters uh, to me yeah. that's in a sense because that. i think its impact is more important like within india like uh, my uh, like i was really fascinated to hear this seminar because this has given me really broad avenues to look at because i'm in my research proposal writing stage so i thank you very much it has been really illuminating because it has given me new ideas and avenues thank you look at and again yeah, sorry and, and again it's about you know so all the value is on the little magazine because it's avant-garde but yeah. you know these are like 50 60000 readers you know which yeah. no hindi publisher gets for their books you know it's yeah. just a different yeah. uh, rate of district of this of diffusion yeah thank you so much thank you Thank you very much um for your question and uh, I think Sheetal uh was next on on the on the list with the hands going up so I'll just come over to you Sheetal um if you can unmute yourself yeah. thanks thanks Francesca um so um I just wanted to ask you because I was and I know that you you also enjoy this aspect of working with magazines so I want to ask you if you can think of it allowed or maybe if you've already thought about it but i was really interested in all the kind of photographs that you showed of like the adverts or like you know um the autobiography of uh, sophia loren or <laughs> or whatever right and, and um not just that but also um the like you already talked about the difference between the editorial and the stories mm -hmm. and also um one thing that i found was really interesting in the in the amrit ray uh, editorial that you showed where he was complaining about the icc there's this the, there's a copy of the letter in english which i think is really interesting right so so what i was wondering really is i mean i know that you said that the reader and the readership is middle brow but can you say more about what the attitude is of the magazine and the editorial and this literary activism like can you think about the reader a little bit like as the object of activism maybe so who is the ideal reader here i'm not talking about the actual readership right like yes of course it's circulating but but the ideal reader behind this curatorial kind of endeavor like what do they want is it a pedagogical thing 
Is it, do they want to produce worldly readers? Is it a case of like, oh, these readers are aspirational, but maybe they don't speak English as has all oh, can't read or access, purchase English? Like, yeah, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. No, that's very, very good uh, question. And I, and I think, yes, again, I, I mean, uh, all these magazines re really want interaction with the readers. So we get a little bit of a sense, you know, of who is writing in and, uh, you know, who is reading, uh, reading the magazines and, and, and really of the kind of, uh, uh, so one of the things that they are, um, and, and certainly, you know, Kahani is very explicit about, is about fostering a critical sense. Huh? So appreciating a good story, you know, appreciate learning to have a sort of a, uh, and, and, and I mean, I thought it was really interesting that the, um, uh, you know, the, the readers to uh, of the Gimaraj Rosa, you know, uh, ish, special issue, you know, they, they, they liked it a lot, you know, and would say, oh, this is really of world literature level. And Berl, they didn't like, they thought, ah, oh, that's a bit disappointing for a Germany, <laughs> they, they can't, can't do better. So, of course, there's also this sense of, uh, uh, you know, identifying the writer with, uh, with the country. Um, I think definitely there's a sense, um, I mean, and, and I've, you know, we know, I know, you know, I've, I've taught it about it before that in a way um, there is a sense that the editors and some of the readers are also right, reading in English. Hmm? So in a way, the absence of more current English writing, I don't know, your, 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 you know, Burgess or, or uh, uh, I don't know, um, uh, Graham Greene or something like that, is it because they are reading them in English? Huh? And so this is about, as you say, going beyond huh? and learning about, and, and there is a certain sense of, uh, this is about learning uh, about literatures that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really interesting that it's not that you don't know about because you're a Hindi reader, whereas you would because you are English, because I think that's true of the English reader at the time. Huh? That's and, right. you know, so one of the interesting things uh, in, the, in the book on the uh, form of ideology, um, so uh, Nilam Shivastav has an article on third world publications in Italy. And, you know, Italy has a lot, several, you know, um, very committed um, communist publishers who want to publish the world, but they don't publish literature. You know, they don't, they don't, you know, they, they, they've got still this kind of, oh, well, it's not good enough. You know, it's not good enough for our standards. You know, it's not this, it's not that. So they, they, they print uh, more political material or surveys, or as I say, testimonials or, no. So I, I think I, you know, that's what, strikes me is that I don't think the English reader at the time was being more, was reading more widely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And certainly the Hindi reader is perceived in class terms as somebody who doesn't have much money. Huh? Yeah. So this kind of, yeah. you know, this lower middle, lower middle class, huh? which is a very Hindi concept, a very Indian mm -hmm. concept, isn't it? You know, the, it's middle class culturally, but lower. So little purchasing uh, power. Uh, mm. And so it's all about, you know, the struggle. Mm? In fact, um, again, it, which is not political in sort of uh, left-like terms. Kamleshwar doesn't seem to be like that. But it's really about all oh, this, the writers and the stories are helping you in the struggle of life. Mm. Right, okay. I would say this, the sort of stories are sort of uh, expressing your state, where you are, you know, your existential struggle and accompanying you in the struggle of life. Mm, that's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shital. Um, next on with the hand up was uh, Sashin. I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. Are you there, Sashin? Yeah. Uh, Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that very enlightening talk. Uh, and uh, I am researching little magazine movements as well as periodical literatures in Gujarati and Marathi. Oh, fantastic. And so this uh, whole discussion, yeah, a whole discussion on Hindi was really an eye opener because as the term that I haven't seen similar stuff much in these languages, though there is significant presence. But uh, the argument that I am developing that in 
spite of the global context and the global uh, uh, dimensions of world literature the i think that's the term that people that the con the primary context of world literature is the vernacular language and uh, the the politics of caste as well as all sorts of literary politics marathi and gujarati are important context for uh, uh, these various ways in which you charted out the world literature was assimilated or uh, refracted and uh, there is the context of nehruvian internationalism to marathi periodical literature strong reaction against this internationalism this uh, whole world literature with the shift in the caste dynamics that underlie uh, literary culture of marathi so i think while we look at the global context and mm -hmm. the whole gallery of uh, and can uh, there is a dimension of uh, that uh, we need to explore yeah so sorry sachin i think i cut uh, i think we are looking at a piece, uh, yeah yeah argument but, or an yeah. intervention even in sorry uh, sachin actually your voice is cutting so i think i got your your question i mean i think a brief answer to that would be that okay. the, there are multiple yeah. uh, multiple projects going on in these magazines no so i think again sarika is an early one where you have dalit, dalit marathi uh, you know stories translated you've got um, um, so but interestingly i find that we you know within hindi literature this story, i mean everybody knows about these magazines and the important role they play but they always think of them as playing an important role in the development of hindi literature you know so they don't think of them as because this were in fact these were the places where you know writers published their work i mean that's that was where you you became a, a writer and you were you got well known and you were but um so i'm not saying that the world literature is the only project that is going on i think there are a lot of other debates both literary ones uh i mean times of india so it's not you know again it's a kind of mainstream is not um, a very you know radical magazine but there are others who are more uh and of course i think marathi is much more radical at this time than than hindi is i mean the caste caste question in hindi comes up later i would say in the 90s uh, 80s 90s and there is also something called nativism that uh, comes up later yeah, yeah, which yeah. seems to be uh, positioning itself against this kind of internationalism yeah. of modernism we don't have ma um, so, nativism uh, in marathi in hindi sorry yeah interestingly i don't know quite know why mm. thank you thank, thank you sachin you. thanks francesca um sorry about the uh, the poor thank connection you. um th yeah. thanks for your question uh and next is a uh, sarah nelson i can see your hand is up oh hi there um actually i i believe that dr orsini answered my question um <laughs> in the chat i'm ah, sorry yeah there's no I mean, repeat it in case it's of public <laughs> interest they don't bother about copyright and they don't never get in touch with writers you know it's not that kind of uh you know network of mm -hmm. uh, of writers i mean interestingly and this is my the work of my student um uh, jan gia about the 1950s i think we, you know it's surprising somebody like uh, uh mulkraj anand you know goes to china nine times over you know a couple of years you know a few years so there you know there is that sort of um um that space of international literary meetings where uh, particular writers uh, will be who are representative so to say or have official positions or particular position will meet each other but not no it's not that kind of yeah that's why i find actually network i think one should be a little bit more cautious in using it for magazines uh, i think there are networks certain magazines are networked and others maybe it's more like you know it's more like uh, 
in India where you have you know the electric connection and then you put your <laughs> you put your uh, <laughs> you connect yourself with it without paying tech without paying the bill I think it's more like that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating thank you thank you very much thanks Sarah thank, thank you Francesca there's a question from uh, Ailet and I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly Ailet pretty good it's Ailet <laughs> Ailet <laughs> Um, um, thank you for a um, really interesting talk. I have a small question that is admittedly sort of serving, but I'm wondering about the interface between this, this Cold War trajectory that you are um, describing and the emergency, right, that happens sort of somewhere there in the middle. And the emergency also obviously has a political import. Um, but it also has a publishing import because of censorship in different ways that different magazines um, sort of found ways around it. And if you find, if you found in your research a shift during those years, and also obviously with Indira Gandhi's um, non-alignment policies and, and, and questions like that. Yeah. So both before yeah. the emergency. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm afraid I haven't gotten so far as the as the emergency, so I can't really say, to be honest, but it's an interesting question and I'll, I'll keep it in mind. I, have, I mean, I don't know what you think, but I have a slight, you know, so again, about non-alignment, it seems to me that, um, but maybe you know you know more. So it seems to me that, you know, with Nehru, he's such a, you know, he's such a protagonist and he's so, you know, again, he meets, you know, Nasser and Tito and T Nasser comes to India and is written about, you know, so there's that sense of uh, um, very much, um, you know, a, a dire interest. With Indira Gandhi, my sense is more like something that gets, that she has uh, inherited hmm? and that, you know, like in fact so many other of, uh, you know, states, men or states persons who go to these countries and you think, is that non-aligned? You know? <laughs> I didn't think that that would be a non-aligned uh, head of state kind of thing. You know, the, it seems to me that membership continues even when positions shift or, or maybe, um, uh, you know, premiers are not so involved anymore. And so I, for me, it's almost like the, the third worldism of Kamleshwa, but I'm, I could be wrong is almost like out of sync of the political uh, third worldism. So, you know, uh, I got a question in an earlier, um, you know, version of this was saying, okay, is this an expression of Bandung? And to me, it's quite interesting that, you know, in the fifties, you don't get actually this kind of visibility mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the, the non-aligned literatures. Uh, you have more than two blocks, uh, really. Uh, I mean, Lu Xun, Everybody print, publishes him in the in the fifties, but otherwise, um, you know, Kenyatta was very much like a lone, a lone, uh, you know, non non Eastern Bloc story, non Eastern or Western Bloc story. There, so it's almost like yeah, which is not unusual that the literature and the political should not be quite so um, so um, yeah, coeval, so to say. No? Or contemporary yeah mm -hmm. but I'll check with the with the emergency yes he's still editor and there were still some uh, some special issues so I don't know if they if he got less uh, political or if you know some politics were okay rather than others yeah I, my my sense is that it was more the rhetoric that was important to Gandhi right she could play with that with being foreign influence non-foreign influence but my sense is that um, that literary magazines were actually free to do more or less. They kind of went under the radar of censorship. Um, but I'm also interested in what they did with that, right? Like, because they could go under the radar, what could be, yeah. uh, what could be published under this just literary? Yeah. Right? So these two, st these two special issues would be uh, during the... No, um, January 1975 would be before. Before, okay. Yeah. And March 77? March 1977 is at the very end. So that, that would actually be, that would actually be an interesting one, especially interesting one for me, but yes. Yes, okay. Uh, but I mean, I know that, you know, some, one of the, I mean, 
from what I know generally is that the Hindi writers were against the emergency. And in fact, you know, there's a famous novel by Nirmal Varma, yes. the emergency and so on. So, but I, I, it'd be interesting to go and check. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And so there's a question um, from Swanadeep in the chat. I don't know if you would like to unmute yourself, Swanadeep. Hello. 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 Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, thank you, ma'am, for this uh, fantastic talk about this particular subject. I am, though I am a, a student of English literature, or I was a, a student of English literature, I have been very fascinated from a very, uh, I, I from a very early sta stage of my education. I have been very much fascinated with uh, the idea of Cold War and you know the warring factions of USA and um, and USSR, the then USSR, and how Nehru actually didn't want to uh, get into any uh, any of the camp, and they and he actually maintained a neutral policy to both of them yeah. so it it is actually very fascinating to see that some of the regional magazines uh, at that time especially hindi actually focused on uh, this you know um this new change in literary literary scene and as as we can see uh, so in my uh, observation when i when i when i when i was listening to your talk that I, I just, uh, this is my observation, that the editors of those magazines raised the importance of a literary fraternity around the world, especially the underdeveloped countries, that of Latin America and Africa. Can this be seen as a form of decolonization where the newly independent India and its magazines detach from the uh, colonial presence of WASP, W-A-S-P, WASP literature? And also, I want to say that through this political process, which decolonial decolonization is actually, we saw how this approach supported the obscure regions of world literature that had never been explored at yeah. that time in the discussion of literature throughout. Because I saw the mention of Cyprian uh, Equency, if I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced yeah. it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the mention of, because, and also the, um, Brazilian short story um, that you have uh, introduced, uh, that you have uh, talked about in the introduction of your um, discussion, mm -hmm. and the, uh, yeah. so the third bank of the river, which is actually very much obscure. We actually comes from the very obscure regions of world literature. So this is right. also, but this is my second question. Yeah. And this is my second question is, um, uh, can this decolonizing process, I mean, th can this process, a political process, be seen as the as a form of decanonize, if I may, yeah. if I may yeah. point this term, decanonize the gi gigantic shadow of world literature? Well, so I mean, I've worked. A, thank you. I've worked a bit. I mean, I worked a bit on magazines before, uh, you know, early twentieth century ones, and. I think you know there are there is already, uh, as I've argued, even there an attempt to go beyond certainly beyond English by looking at you know Russia, France, opening to you know Chinese, uh, East Asian poetry, uh, both in Hindi and other languages. Uh, but certainly, I mean that's why I'm interested. You know, I find here this is this whole Africa, um, Latin America is quite unprecedented. And as I was saying, I mean, I was trying to say, yes, yeah, absolutely, decolonizing. That's that's also the part of the of the um, of the rhetoric. Though, I mean, as I say, the stories are, you know, not necessarily telling that particular uh, narrative. But it's not the only one. I mean, if you look at who's the story, what the story from the view of the masters. I mean, they're much more familiar names, aren't they? Huh? And I love the Aldo Saxley assault stories like science, you know, it's a really funny uh, sort of way of, um, of defining it. Um, so I wouldn't say that, so I think that both things are going on at the same time, you know, a certain kind of uh, um, sense of who is canonical, mm? uh, which includes, um, you know, Colin Wilson, for example, mm? 
or uh, or um, carrot as uh, as uh, as um, um, canonical, but with the decolonizing uh, as well. So I think it's a bit of the it's it's not uh, just the decanonizing one. But um, in from this list, I can only see Aldous Huxley's name, which can be considered as from the you know the British uh, literary canon. That, well, I'm not but, sure. I mean, I mean, not British, but you could say sort of uh, European. I mean, Sartre, Flaubert, Camus, Chekhov. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Faulkner, D. H. Lawrence, Dostoevsky. They are, I mean, they're very canonical. And in fact, sorry, yeah. if I can, if I can add, uh, one of the interesting things I think is is a, a challenge in working with magazines is to, and I and I think I don't I don't I'm not successful there is to try and see yourself. Um, through those eyes who are not familiar. I mean, typically what happens to me is I look at these names and I think, oh, sorry, let me just check, go back to the ones I know. Uh, and for me, it's impossible not to, sorry, just, yeah. It's impossible not to go and see, oh my God, you know, this is, these are the writers I already know. Uh, so, and to think, uh, so in a way is a post-canonizing glance, mine, uh, post-canonical. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and to think about, okay, and which is why I was curious in, with the Kalpana way of, you know, give you a whole lot of names in which you have Neruda and uh, Borges and so on, but you also have lots, hundreds of other names that, you know, do not become canonized. What happens then? And I think here, you know, it's really interesting to think about um what would a hindi you know maybe without the paratext you know are you more reacting to the story mm, than to the you okay. know the, the canon you know you will find out later that these are canonical or you or you've been told that actually Guimarães Rosa is one of the most famous sort of latin american writers oh, um, right. uh, but um which is i suppose again uh you know with she Shita, of course has thought a lot a story about much more than I have, but in terms of, you know, it's striking to me that one of the things that are always come with a story is memorable. So the idea that, you know, oh, okay. with stories is like um, the, the, the amount is so vast huh? and you are reading them uh, piecemeal. So, I mean, typically I don't remember the title of a story ever, uh, but, you know, I, I remember the, the writer more but maybe it's the opposite. People will remember the title, but not the writer. So, you know, um, the idea that a story is for consumption and that, you know, it's, um, you know, you, you consume it and then perhaps you forget it hmm, is, uh, is also maybe part of the, you know, of the kind of story and world literature dynamics. Hmm? Right, right. Hmm. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Ford. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so we, 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 are, we are coming up to half past, but there are a couple more questions in the chat and there's one more person with their hand up. So I'll go to the person with their hand up and then perhaps I can finish on the couple of questions in the chat, if that's okay. It's Philip with their hand up. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, yeah. Hello. Hi. And thank you for this great talk. Um, it was very great. Um, I'm, I'm especially interested in the question of form, uh, form of the short story. Um, and I think you mentioned that countries were sort of discussed as an international language. Or I guess so. I wanted to ask a little bit: is there, was there any discussion? on the question of the form of the short story in the, in the text that you discussed, or, and did you also sort of see any sort of development or discussion about, because I was wondering about this, the short story as this truly international form of this genre, which is always sort of, seems the international circulation seems sort of constitutive to the form itself. So I was wondering if sort of in the time frame we were looking at those and like to be more, I don't know, fragmentary or this is just sort of this universal form that has the same sort of thing that to be talked about. Your, uh, your voice came very, uh, with a lot of uh, echo, so I'm not sure that I got everything, but it was really about so, do they discuss form and, uh, yeah, I mean, so, um, 
I mean, I confess I haven't read everything you can, of the of these magazines. So you know, there's uh, I've read more of the editorials and uh, and especially and perhaps you know, going back to the earlier question. Uh, so in the very long editorial on the story, the history of the story in uh, in one of the special issues. Um, and sorry, Philip, I'll come to your question, but something that's come to mind is, I mean, I think also one of the reasons why they like the story and it's different from the novel is that it's, um, one can point to local, his, different local histories and, and genealogies of the story. Huh? So you can say it's not all about, you know, so you can go from the story was born in you know, Egypt and in Assyria and in India and in China. Uh, and then you go to the sort of modern show story, and then it becomes less problematic to say that all oh, the modern masters were, you know, uh, Chekhov or, you know, Poe or so on, or it's less this kind of burden of the imported form that sort of uh, haunts the novel. In terms of the actual form of the stories, um, what I've been struck, so I've been struck in the, I've read those articles on the contemporary Iranian and Indonesian and Egyptian story. And what seems to me to be going on there is, as I, as I briefly mentioned, a kind of mapping of the Hindi critical discourse on, on those traditions. So to say, okay, you know, you had earlier, you know, you had sort of um, stories that were not realistic before, you had the, you know, Thousand and One Nights, uh, like that. Then you have, uh, you know, colonialism or sort of semi-colonialism. You had the rise of, you know, realism. You, the, the, you know, uh, Egyptian st uh, writers were struggling with, you know, Western and kind of local traditions. Then they found a balance. There is social realism. But then a new generation of writers are now sort of um, uh, developing a more subtle language huh? uh, that they are trying to capture the nuances of the new, um, uh, you know, the new conditions and the kind of the, so the, the, the language, as I say, is, you know, it's like 100% that of Hindi short story debates, which of course were, you know, huge at this time. I mean, the short story was the most debated genre uh, at this time, I would say, or equally with poetry. So, um, I, I mean, I suppose that rather than, so you don't have a discussion of say, Nouveau Roman or, you know, of all the style of, hmm? Hmm? because in a way you're using your own discussion of style to, um, of style and, and uh, yes, to, 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 to deal with that or to sort of to, to describe that if, if it makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Philip, for your question. Thanks, Francesca. Just a couple more questions in the chat before, before we thank you and, and let you go, Francesca, if, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, and there was one more question. I'll just read them out. The, the, the final question needs reading because the person can't speak on the line. Um, the, I'm just finding it, yeah, so it a qu another question from Nimi was, um, is there evidence these publications follow the Hindi-speaking diaspora yeah, um, in this time to the UK and the USA? And then the, I'll give you both at the same time, that's okay. And then the second question is from Aritra, um, who says women of the socialist bloc and those of the developing world refer to themselves as activists rather than feminists since they view the latter word as a definition of the capitalistic bourgeoisie mentality of the West and uh, one that creates a rift between the bourgeois women with their working class sisters. How did the India magazine deal with this ideological debate concerning uh, uh, women's question, the women's question? Right. Uh, well, I think with Aritra, I'm afraid I have to say I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't think these, these magazines particularly uh, particularly dealt with this question. I mean, I think there are, even, I mean, even now there are, you know, special issue. I mean, I don't, there are not, I mean, there are, there are, and there have been feminist magazines or, you know, women's magazines and so on, which have published literature. But I think 
magazines like this tend to have a women special issues or women writer special issues that tends to be again a bit more eclectic rather than saying taking particular positions as far as I as far as I'm aware so I think I'm a bit of a blank on that um, on that question now maybe somebody else could answer better uh, so the other one the Hindi speaking diaspora in the UK and the USA well um, I mean I don't I think there is such a Hindi speaking diaspora that they can really write about. What interestingly, what they have, uh, I mean, Abhimanyu Anat, this uh, Hindi writer from Mauritius, is very much there. There's interesting this part of Africa, uh, uh, and uh, so the Hindi diaspora elsewhere. And um, the Indian World Literature Special Issue had a translation from. Um, uh, an area of darkness by Naipaul, taking issue with it already, you know, so early on, which is again quite interesting, you know, so very much registering it, but also kind of, you know, uh, registering its critique uh, of it. So, um, yeah, I think that would be my brief answer there. I'm really sorry. I think I asked the question incorrectly on there. My question was more. Did these magazine publications follow those who moved over in the 1960s and 70s? Were they being bought here? Because there's a lot of Hindi papers and Hindi publications in that sense. Sorry, I asked it back to you. All right, back. all right. Um, to be honest, I, I um, although I imagine it would not be maybe so easy to get these, uh, these magazines, but I think they would, I mean, if anything would travel, it would be this kind of magazines, to be honest. Huh? What else would you want to read? Hmm? Yeah. What What else would you want to sort of subscribe to or read or something? Yeah. Hmm. Well, just to say thank you uh, to Francesca, to our speaker, and to all of those who asked questions, and to all of all of you who joined us today. Um, we're really uh, delighted uh, to be carrying on the series on the. 2nd of December um, and I'm just posting the link in the chat as I promised before um, if you'd like to sign up to that next session on eco translation so it's slightly uh, slightly different but um, within the same series on world literature and translation and just yes yeah, thank you Francesca um, thank you all we'll give you a kind of virtual mm. round of applause and um, yes do join us for these sessions and take a look at the website uh, for future sessions and we'll be publishing a program for, for next year um, very soon. So do keep an eye on our website uh, for that. But uh, thank you and uh, we hope you have a, a, lovely, a lovely evening. Thank you for all your wonderful questions. Bye bye. <laughs>